Today, on Know the Truth from Philip DeCourcy. God wants us authentic. Now, authenticity is not perfection, but it's reality. It's desire. It's heart. It's certainly trying to be what you profess to be. God would rather hear, God be merciful to me, a sinner, than I thank God I'm not like any other man. Many churches attempt to water down the gospel and make it more palatable. They shy away from talk about justice and wrath, focusing on the more seeker-friendly topics. But today on Know the Truth, Philip DeCourcy explains that the early church didn't shy away from hard truths. And through their courageous commitment to God's Word, they grew into a global movement that has lasted to this day. We're in Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. And here's Philip wrapping up a message called, For Real. If we're honest, we've all played the hypocrite in some form, in some context, at some time. So given that trait, given that temptation, I want to come to Acts chapter 5, verses 1 to 11, where we have the disturbing details of the death of Ananias and Sapphira because of their hypocrisy before God. This is a passage that shows God confronting pretending and posing and posturing in a very dramatic way. This is a text that signals to us the fact that God hates hypocrisy. God has a distaste for spiritual phoniness, because that's what's going on here. Ananias and Sapphira pretend to give everything when they only give something, and they're playing at church. And God catches their hypocrisy, and God exposes their phoniness. And before I move on to my point, that's a sin that Jesus warns about constantly in His ministry. In Matthew 6, 1 to 6, Matthew 15, 5, Matthew 23, 13 to 36, as an example, Jesus will say again and again and again to His disciples, beware of the hypocrites. Don't be hypocrites, guys. In fact, the Greek word for hypocrite is to wear a mask. Because in in the Greek theater or the Roman Empire, actors went in and out of character by swapping masks. They held up a mask on almost like a stick or a lollipop, and they kind of acted behind the mask. That's where we get the idea, hypocrite. It's to put a mask on. It's to pretend to be something or someone you're not. John MacArthur is right. None are so ugly in God's sight as those who flaunt the spiritual beauty they do not possess. Listen to me. God would rather hear from you in all your brokenness. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I've messed up again. I've failed again. I haven't come through for you in a way that I wished I would have. God would rather hear, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, than this idea of, I thank God I'm not like any other man. Putting on some kind of pretense, pretending to be something you're not, posing, pretending, posturing, to win the favor of man, to gain respect. You and I need to be aware of and beware of a creeping phoniness. It's possible in your life and my life. So true of a pastor. That's why John Piper wrote that book, Brothers, We Are Not Professionals, because there can be a creeping professionalism and phoniness that marks the pastoral life, and it can mark the Christian life. God wants us authentic. Now, authenticity is not perfection but it's reality. It's desire. It's heart. It's certainly trying to be what you profess to be. Watch out when words replace action. You're becoming a phony. If your talk is bigger than your obedience, you and I are on the path to phoniness. Watch out for outward conformity replacing inward reality. Watch out for reputation replacing character. See, reputation is what others think you to be. Character is what you know yourself to be. And sometimes there's a big difference between both. That's phoniness. Watch out for human approval replacing the fear of God. I have a wonderful book in my study. Highly recommend it to all. It's an old book, but it's worth 
Redigging That Well, Practical Religion by Bishop J.C. Ryle. He's got a chapter in that book on reality. He says this, there is hardly a grace in the character of a true Christian of which you will not find a counterfeit described in the Word of God. And then he goes on to show there's unreal repentance. Judas Iscariot repented, but it was unreal. It was inauthentic. It was about him, not the glory of God. He was sad because he got caught and what he lost, not because the law of God had been broken. There's unreal faith. You realize the devils believe? But that's not real faith. That's not God-honoring commitment. The devils believe and tremble. It's all here, nothing here. Unreal holiness. Read about King Joash back in the Old Testament in Chronicles 24, 2, and it says that he was holy and he was good so long as Jehoiada the priest lived. He played the game. But once Jehoiada died... Joash stopped following the Lord. That's a fake holiness. What about unreal love? Let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed, 1 John 3, verse 8. What about unreal humility? The Pharisees were good at that. Jesus says, for pretense, they made long prayer standing at the street corner. They were faking humility, faking religious devotion, unreal worship. Matthew 15, verse 8, the people draw nigh to me with their mouths, but their hearts are far from me. My friend, watch out for creeping phoniness. Seek to be real. Better to be real in your brokenness than phony in some pretended obedience. I wrote a little list down to myself. I don't have time to, to weigh it out, just maybe to guard your heart and my heart against phoniness. Weigh your words. Fear the spotlight guard your times with God alone, make promises ever so slowly, and fight self-love. You know, for a time, as many of you know, our our daughter Angela and her husband Nathan fostered two little girls that we ultimately lost, but who still hold a a large corner in our hearts. And, And the oldest of them, she had a wonderful way of responding to something like, if I would say to her, you know what, get your coat, we're going for ice cream. Her immediate response was, for real? I loved it. Hey, we're going to the beach. Get your stuff. For real? I never forgot the day we told her for the first time in her life that she was going to Disneyland. That was a big, big, for real? I wonder if it was her background. I wonder if it was broken promises that she'd experienced across her life. It was hard. It wasn't maybe easy for her to believe. What do you mean? Really? I'm going for ice cream? Beach? Huh? Disneyland? Yeah, for real. And I love delivering on those promises. It's for real. And sometimes I wonder, I often think about her as we do and pray for her and her sister. As we pray and worship and serve God, I wonder if God doesn't look and say, for real? Is it for real? Hopefully we can say, Lord, it's for real. Oh, it's got imperfections, and it's got blemishes, and it falls short of your glory, but it's for real. I love you, and I want to love you more. I want to obey you more. Time's gone. Let me bring out a couple of things. The deaths and the development, we'll wrap this up. Just a couple of minutes on the deaths. It deserves a better treatment than I'm going to give it. The deaths. Because in in verses 3 through 6, we read when Peter, no doubt, through divine perception, exposes the lie they're living and the the phoniness and the fakery. We read that Ananias falls down dead. Fear grips the church. Young men wrap him up and carry him out and bury him. Three hours later, the same thing happens, verses 7 through 10. Ananias' wife, Sapphira, was very much aware of what he had done. That becomes clear. Uh, She was in on the conspiracy, and she too drops down dead at the apostles' feet. And they are buried without ceremony. They are buried without grief. Striking. Buried without ceremony, buried without grief. Now, the custom of the day was to bury someone on the day of their death because of the heat and decomposition. But if you go to Deuteronomy 21, verses 22 to 23, if someone had committed a grave sin and had been hung on a tree, they were to be buried immediately, lest their disobedience kind of shame and scandalize 
the land. And no doubt they were buried, which was immediately because that was custom, but because of the scandal of their sin. Now, two things about God's judgment. Number one, it was severe. Number two, it was salutary. Quickly. Severe and salutary. I mean, it is severe, isn't it? It's kind of jarring. They just dropped down dead at the apostles' feet. It's almost like a summary execution. But I want you to understand the severity of this. Let me say this. This passage offends so many because sin's offense to God offends so few. Al Mohler's right. We have lost our sense of God's limitless perfection. The only reason this passage jars with us is because we don't have the foggiest idea of how holy God is, and we forget that all sin is mortal. And the only reason that you and I are alive is the grace of God and the mercy of God. When sin is finished, it brings forth death. It's only a matter of time and place. And apart from the grace of God, we're all dead men and dead women walking. And we need to bear that in mind, because they sinned against the Holy Spirit, and against God, verses 3 and 4. They committed spiritual perjury. And then we read in verse 9, as Peter challenges Sapphira, he says, how is it that you have agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? Does that ring a bell? Testing the Spirit of the Lord? That's the sin of the generation that died in the wilderness, where they tested the Lord with their grumbling and their mumbling, complaining, and desiring to go back to Egypt. Read about it in Deuteronomy 6, 16, Psalm 78, verses 17 to 19. Ananias and Sapphira lost their life because their sin grieved God, their sin hurt the church, and their sin was high-handed hypocrisy. It was flagrant, deliberate, and planned. And you and I need to grasp that because we're all hypocrites to some degree. We all keep up appearances to some degree. But we're not all hypocrites to the same degree. And a couple of commentators have pointed out that we need to make that distinction because there are sensitive souls, even in this meeting this morning, who are grieving over their sin, who almost didn't come to church. And when they're at the church, they don't feel worthy to be here. And a message like this just reminds them of how far they've fallen short of God's glory. And they know that they haven't been all that they want to be. And and maybe people think better of them than they are. And so there's this sense, I must be an Ananias and Sapphira. No, not of your repenting, not of your grieving, not of you even sense that if you have a knowledge of your hypocrisy and the emptiness of your life that needs filling, you're not where they're at. Their sin, they planned it. It was deliberate. It was flagrant. And it indeed became a target for God's holiness. It was a solitary judgment, solitary judgment. It was a warning to others, and that's the effect of it. Look at verse 5, and great fear came upon all those who heard these things. Look at verse 11, so great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard these things. In fact, verse 5 is the Greek word phobos, where we get phobia. This isn't the fear of awe. This is just downright fear. They're trembling. The church has been chilled by this divine discipline of these two fellow believers. God judged them so that the leaven of their sin would not spread and corrupt the church any further. You realize there's three judgments? I don't have time to develop this other than to throw it your way. There's three judgments a believer faces. One's past, one's present, one's future. We're judged as sinners, servants, and sons. We were judged as sinners at Calvary. John 5, 24, if we believe in Jesus Christ and the one that sent him, we will not come into judgment. We will pass from death unto life. Our sins were judged in Jesus. That's a past judgment, the judgment of our sin and the judgment of us as sinners on Calvary. There's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Amen? Then you're judged as a servant. That's future. That's at the bema. That's at the judgment seat of Christ. This is for rewards and standing in the life to come. 2 Corinthians 5, 9 to 10, what we did in the body will be judged and rewards will be given. Then there's the judgment as sons that's present through discipline. That's Hebrews 12, 3 to 11. Those whom God loves, He disciplines as a son. I believe Ananias and Sapphira were believers. They're being judged as a son and daughter of God who have failed, and their failure is grave, and the discipline is grave, and the discipline comes in the form of a premature death. That's a scary thought, but it's a real thought. They sinned with a high hand. 
deliberately, flagrantly. They conspired against the Holy Spirit, the church, and themselves. Do you remember read 1 Corinthians 11, verse 30? There were those who were abusing the Lord's table, hurting the body of Christ. And it says, for that reason, some of you are sick and some of you sleep. The word sleep there is the idea of death. 1 John 5, 16 to 17, there's a sin unto death. You can sin and keep on sinning in such a manner that's flagrant that the Lord in His mercy takes you home. There are Christians in heaven before they need to be there, and it's a mercy so that they don't sin anymore and they don't scandalize the church any greater. And it was a mercy to the church because their death was salutary. It was exemplary. 1 Corinthians 10, 11 talks about those who died in the wilderness as an example. Sodom and Gomorrah was an example according to Jude 7. Want to know what God thinks about homosexuality or immorality? Well, you know, go and stand over a pile of ashes on the plains of Sodom and Gomorrah. It's an example. And you know what? You'll find that theme throughout the book of Acts. We're being reminded you you cannot trifle with God with impunity. Judas dies in a gory heap, chapter 1. Herod Agrippa is struck down and eaten by worms in chapter 12. And the Jewish magician and false prophet Bar-Jesus is struck blind in chapter 13. Remember what Charles Simeon said of the portrait of Henry Martin, the missionary who died in Persia at a young age for the cause of the gospel? And as he died, a portrait of him arrived in the office of Charles Simeon in Cambridge, England. He was his mentor. He hung it up above his mantelpiece, and he said, every time I looked at those eyes, they seemed to say to me, don't trifle, don't trifle. The development as we close, it's verses 13 and 14, kind of moving outside the text. Fear grips the church, and the news spreads, verse 11. And we read in verse 13, none of the rest dare join them. And the people esteemed them highly. See, the culture honors a church that holds itself to the high standards of God's words. This idea of dumbing things down for the culture is the wrong way to go. There's nothing seeker-sensitive about Acts 5. This is a church committed to holiness. This is a church that disciplines its members. And you know what? It doesn't put people off. The people respect it. And they realize that Christianity is not some phony, baloney, religious scam. This is a real thing that changes people's lives irrevocably. The church was besotted with the presence of a holy God, and in verse 14, many came to faith. Through the death of Ananias and Sapphira, the integrity of the church was salvaged, the gospel was magnified, and the surrounding culture was reminded that Christianity is not phony, baloney. The credibility gap between the church and the culture, which hypocrisy creates, was bridged in the church at Jerusalem through a life lived out truly for Jesus Christ. Here's my parting thought. People in Acts 5 came to believe the gospel because they believed in the people who believed the gospel. Their lives were real. Not perfect, okay, but real, authentic. This was Christianity at a cross. This was Christianity willing to pay a price. This was Christianity that was real, marked by integrity. Listen, we cannot make a real impact until we're real. If you're phony baloney, if you're living a lie, if it's all shop front, shop window stuff, you're not going to make an impact for Jesus Christ. People believe in Christ more easily when they meet believable Christians. You've got to be living it, my friend, with an unsaved spouse, someone you work with in the office who's against the gospel. If you want to see them believe, you've got to be believable. Not perfect, but believable. Real. You pray, you read, you go to church, you live it, you're sacrificial, you're loving, you're gracious, you forgive your enemies. I'll finish with this as the team comes up. I just remembered this story as I put my last sentence on my notes of the time behind the Iron Curtain when the church was suffering. And during that service, two soldiers interrupted the service that had been meeting in secret, and they pointed their AK-47s at the pastor, and they told the congregation to line up against the walls of the church building. And they threatened to kill the pastor. They threatened to imprison the people, and they gave people opportunity to leave if they wanted to deny Christ and not pay a price. One or two slipped out, but the vast majority stayed. The pastor was unflinching. 
The men raised the guns, they cocked their weapons, but the pastor refused. The people were at peace. And then all of a sudden, the soldiers put their guns down and declared that they had recently come to faith in Jesus Christ and were simply testing the reality of the faith of this congregation because they wanted to join an authentic body of believers. You see, people believe in Jesus more readily when they find us believable. For real? I hope you're real. hope I'm real. Becoming more real. The inauthentic life is an impediment to the gospel and the blessing of God. Father, we thank you for our time in Acts 5, not as long as we would like, not as deep as we would wish to go, but certainly there's a billboard message for us here that you hate hypocrisy, that you desire truth in the inward parts, that you want our walk to match our talk. You want everything to begin in the heart, not in the mouth. And so help us to to be challenged this morning by this shocking story in Acts 5. We see that their death is salutary. It's a warning, and we have been duly warned. Lord, help us to be sincere and authentic. Help us indeed to love you with all of our heart and with all of our strength and with all of our soul. Help us not to put a pretense on if we're hurting. Help us to share that hurt and seek help. If we're in a cycle of sin and disobedience, help us to seek help and break from that. Help us to remember that you're always open to God. Be merciful to me, a sinner. It's, it's the Pharisee, it's the phony that gets you angry. And so, Lord, uh, sanctify us through this sanctifying word this morning, for we pray and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. A sobering reminder to check our hearts and motivations. You're listening to Know the Truth, the Bible teaching ministry of Philip DeCourcy. We're in a study of Acts called Ready, Steady, Grow. And to help you go deeper in this series, we've got a book we recommend called Gospel DNA by Richard Koken. This book unpacks the 20th chapter of Acts and shows how each of us can contribute to the health and growth of our local church, whether we're sitting in the pews or preaching from the pulpit. We'll send you a copy of Gospel DNA as our way of saying thanks for your financial support of this ministry. You can send your donations online at ktt.org or by calling 888-644-8811. That's 888-644-8811. Or if you'd like to take your support to the next level, consider automating your gift as a monthly Truth Ambassador. It's quick and easy to set up. Again, just go to ktt.org. One last thing before we close, as part of our commitment to supporting local churches, we've got an event coming up soon for pastors and church leaders. Philip, I know you're really looking forward to this. Why don't you tell us about it? Yes, that's right, Wayne. We're really excited about this conference. It's the 6th Annual Intrust Men's Leadership Conference, and it's coming up soon on November the 4th, right here in Anaheim Hills, California. And this year's theme is something I believe will resonate with everyone leading through conflict. I think we all know we're living in divisive, polarizing times, both inside and outside the church. And that means it's more important than ever that leaders know how to navigate conflict well. Ephesians 4 reminds us to endeavor, to work hard at keeping the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And so I'd encourage you to join us for this event. We'll learn how to lead as men of the Word and live out the high calling God has given us as leaders within Christ's church. There's no cost, and registration is now both open for in-person and virtual attendance. If you're planning to join us in person, breakfast and lunch will be provided. And if you're not able to make it out to Orange County, then why not join us via live stream? So mark your calendar, register today, at IntrustConference.org, we in. All right. Thank you, Philip. I'll give that web address once more in case anyone missed it. Go to IntrustConference.org. And for those who aren't pastors or leaders, maybe consider sending the website along to leaders at your church and invite them to attend. I'm your host, Wayne Shepherd. Glad to have you with us today. And be sure to come back Tuesday when we'll discuss the secret to church growth as we continue our study in Acts. That's next time on Know the Truth.
Today's program was produced and sponsored by Know the Truth Incorporated. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free.